When you're thinking about radiogenomics, we can get to a very granular level here, um, but a little bit of what I'm going to talk about is more kind of, you know, at a, at a more superficial level of how we're bringing in some of the genomic tests that we have and MRI into this space of selecting patients for surveillance versus treatment. Um, so we all know that surveillance is safe in well-selected patients. We have data from the PIVOT trial, from the PROTECT trial that show that we don't see a big difference in cancer outcomes when we have appropriately selected men. We've seen the uh, uptake of active surveillance around the world now. Um, so I think, you know, it's more and more catching on here. This is data from Lori Klotz's uh, uh, research, and this is basically looking at active surveillance over time, and you can see that while some men do die on active surveillance, there's very few that are actually dying from prostate cancer. So it does appear to be a safe alternative to immediate treatment. Now, one of the things that his data also did show is when we expand surveillance to including guys with more higher volumes of Gleason 6 or even some volume of Gleason 4, we've started to see uh, different outcomes. And we can see here that there is a reduction or there are an increase in actually metastasis in patients that actually had intermediate risk disease. And most of that is driven by those patients that had some component of pattern 4 on their biopsy. So this is obviously something that we have to be very careful about as we're selecting these patients and we're doing more and more surveillance in guys that are a little higher risk. And I think some of the tools that we've been discussing here today are some of the ones that we're using the most to try to help with that. And that's multiparametric MRI of the prostate. Uh, we, I touched on this slide a little bit earlier, but the biggest issue with this is obviously the negative predictive value. If you have a negative MRI, it doesn't necessarily mean that the patient doesn't have a component of pattern 4 sitting in the prostate somewhere. And this is data from Dr. Hader's trial, the ASSIST trial, when they looked at MRI in patients that were coming with a diagnosis of low risk disease and they were coming for the confirmatory biopsy. They got randomized to having a trust guided systematic biopsy versus uh, an MRI uh, for the confirmatory biopsy and then a targeted biopsy afterwards. And they actually didn't see any difference in the rate of upgrading at the confirmatory biopsy. Now, I do believe that this trial was mainly for guys with low risk disease, and we don't know if this would change as we start to apply this more towards guys with more intermediate risk features. Uh, we touched a little bit about this as well earlier today, and this is basically from Dr. Stoyanova's group in the UM right now and looking at uh, this habitat risk score, but another form of AI that we're using to kind of um, to basically use as an adjunct to the radiological reads. And the thought is if we introduce this into this, could we do a better job at finding some of these cancers that we're not seeing on typical standard care MRI? And could it even be more helpful for following these tumors as we move along, reducing the number of biopsies that we may need to do in men? Uh, I showed this data earlier. This was just basically looking at this in patients that had radical prostatectomy, and we actually found it did a fairly reasonable job and actually better than some of the, um, the, the radiological interpretations we've had. Now, switching gears a little bit more to the genomic tests, we all know that these tests exist and they all have numerous papers showing that they're independent predictors of various important outcomes. Um, but there are a few limitations. This is Dr. Cooperberg's paper that you talked about a little bit earlier, and we can see that even when you look at the patients with low risk, there's a, a, a huge diversity in terms of their genomic instability, and some of these patients even tend to have very high risk feature or, or genomics, and uh, that may be a signal that there may be more going on than we anticipate based on just the pathology alone. But there have been some studies that have come out that have put some limitations on this. So this was a study where they looked at prostatectomy and they took samples from various parts of the prostate and they sent it off for um, different tests and then actually sent off the different cores for the same test. So if you look at this here, this is basically looking at um, an oncotype, to uh, uh, oncotype test and you're looking at four different cores from the same prostate and you can see that they see different things depending on which core they sent. And then here, the same core was sent for three different tests, and again, you're kind of seeing different things depending on which test you use. So it really kind of begs the picture of when we're doing this in patients in active surveillance and we're only sending one core, would the information be different if we sent a different core or perhaps if we didn't actually find uh, the core with the highest cancer? This was a study for the Michigan group, and what they wanted to look at is if you had a patient like this where they have a focus of um, Gleason 6 cancer and nothing else in the prostate versus a patient like this that has a focus of Gleason 6 cancer next to a higher grade tumor, how often is the genomics from this going to tell you about the presence of a higher grade person? And when you look at all three of these different genomic signatures, you can see that they weren't that different. So it kind of suggested that this may not tell you whether you have a more aggressive cancer sitting in the prostate next to your grade group 1. Uh, so the thought is, can we bring MRI into this picture to try to do a better job? And can MRI, we know that it does a better job finding more aggressive pathology, and if we're taking samples from that, can we also find the more aggressive 
genomics. And that's been our approach at the University of Miami. We use uh, some of this AI software to basically segment the prostate, delineate where the tumor habitats are going to be, and then do these uh, mapping biopsies. And we use that to look at what the pathology and the actual uh, genomics is going to look like. And so that is really the basis for an active surveillance trial that we have going on, the Miami um, Active Selection versus Treatment uh, Trial. And essentially, it, we try to have a fairly expansive criteria for selection, so anyone from basically very low risk to intermediate, so we allow up to four cores of cancer in this trial, and two of them could be Gleason 3 plus 4. We don't really have any um, uh, exclusion criteria based on the amount of cancer in a core or anything like that, and so these patients, they, uh, once they're screened and enrolled, they have blood and urine that's taken, then they have an MRI, and then they have a confirmatory biopsy uh, at the time of their entry into the trial. And then they'll actually go and have another MRI and a biopsy every year for the next three years. Now, I know that that may be more biopsies than needed uh, for many of these guys, but it was more kind of just to get a better sense of how the MRI is tracking these cancers. And we do uh, annual blood and post-DRE urine on these patients as well. So we have almost, we've just, we pretty much hit 200, which was the number we were looking to accrue. And we can see that most of these guys have actually gone through their baseline confirmatory biopsy. A lot have had their 12-month biopsy, and there's a good handful now uh, that have actually finished the trial. And uh, as we've gone through, we've collected a lot of uh, data and basically a lot of these specimens here. Most of these, we have about a third of patients that have progressed, and most of them go on to radical prostatectomy, so we get the specimen to actually look at. Uh, we've got, we originally started doing this gene expression, and the way we do it was we would actually send every single core, and we were doing this with Genome DX. Uh, that had to stop for a while, and we've kind of just continued accruing the trial, but we're now going to be able to do a lot of this in-house using the same platforms and chips that they use. And we've been collecting 4K scores, CTC data on these patients as they go along as well. So some of the things that we were hoping to answer based on this was which constellation, I mean, we have molecular markers that we're getting on patients at the be beginning, we're getting MRI on patients, and we're getting these genomic markers, and we're doing it serially. And we want to know when you take a clinical model, like a CAPR score or NCCN risk score, how much does each of these things add to better selecting patients for surveillance versus treatment? We wanted to know, uh, in terms of the genomic information, how does that differ between different cores? Which genomic test would be the best one to use if we can compare? compare them head to head, and also to kind of get a better sense of how MRI actually predicts the progression on the biopsy. So with respect to genomics, um, this is basically kind of some of the data on this first 50 or so patients that we had. And you can see these are the different Gleason grade groups here, and you can see, and the majority of these guys are obviously guys that progressed on the trial. The red is low risk, the green is kind of intermediate, and the, the blue are getting into the high risk features. And you can see as you go from increasing grade group, you are seeing more, um, less low risk and more high risk as you'd expect. But in each of these, you're seeing kind of a lot of variability within each of the grade groups in each of the signatures. So, you know, you do see some guys with uh, high Gleason scores that have very low genomic risk, some guys with low Gleason scores that have very high genomic risk. And this is an, an anecdotal uh, situation, obviously, but this is one patient that had two cores on his biopsy, uh, diagnostic biopsy, all Gleason 6, and then in the confirmatory, he had a lot of uh, cores that were positive, and some, one of them even 4 plus 3. But you can say when you're looking at the decipher, the cell cycle, or genomic, uh, the GPS, it's all over the place uh, in terms of, you know, which core you sent. So, and in some situations, you actually see that this crosses risk levels. So I think it does matter what you hit. It's not that the, you know, the low-grade cancer is always going to tell you the genomics of the high-grade cancer that may, may not have seen. And this is a box plot pretty much of, you know, all the patients that we have the data on. But on average, depending on which core you sent and which test you use, you can actually have seen a change in the genomic risk level from 10 to 15, 57 percent of the time. Now, we're looking at this data in terms of how the MRI-targeted biopsies compare to the random or the template ones, and we're also looking at this in terms of whether you're sending the most aggressive core and the, you know, the largest uh, volume core as well. This is more from the uh, HRS standpoint. Again, I think I showed this earlier today, but this was a patient that had uh, an MRI done at the time. They did not see this, le this lesion that was actually detected on the first MRI here and had grown on his second MRI, but had we had sampled it here, we probably would have found him earlier on in the process. So could some of these tools also help improve our selection of these patients? So there's a few, you know, translational goals we have on this trial as it continues to go on. And now that we've accrued these patients and are just following, we hope that we'll get some of this data out to you guys soon. Obviously, the radiomics, AI, and deep learning, as Dr. Hader talked about, and could this be more helpful not just in selecting patients but monitoring them? Because most of the data we've seen in people that are monitoring with MRI, so it's not been that helpful. But maybe when you add this to it, it could be. 
from a genomic landscape, we'll get a better understanding of how to use these tests. Knowing what I've seen so far, I would just send every single core and like the way we do with pathology, but obviously that's going to be cost prohibitive. So trying to find a better way to do that and how we know we're going to get the highest genomic risk. Uh, there's an opportunity for discovery, because we know most of these uh, genomic markers were not necessarily um, developed in patients on surveillance. They were developed in RADP patients and then applied there. And then we are doing uh, some molecular markers on these patients. We get 4K scores every year on people, and so kind of getting a better idea of how that helps um, is also something. So in conclusion, we know active surveillance is safe. We know that patient selection is key to this, and we do think that MRI and genomics are going to be helpful, and they work complementary together. However, I think quantitative imaging will help uh, improve uh, the power of MRI in following these patients, and I think future trials on how to better use the MRI and these genomic information will be critical. Thank you.